happy scientists and rad researchers. Welcome to MICE Tech Talk with the Technical Information Scientists of the Jackson Laboratory. My name is Dr. Caitlin, and I'm coming to you from my house on the East Coast of the United States. Hey, Caitlin, and I'm Dr. Janine, coming to you from a window in my house that allows the appropriate illumination of my face. <laughs> Our job as technical information scientists, or TIS as we like to say in the business, is to serve the research community by answering all your mouse-related questions. So you might recognize us from our formal webinars on Thursday, or you may have called us at 7.58 p.m. on a Friday night. You know who you are. <laughs> so since many of us are now working from home, we wanted to give you guys another opportunity, a different format to connect with you. And I kind of think of it like a hybrid between a webinar and a phone call. Uh, we're going to focus on things that are frequently asked questions that we typically hear about you by phone or email, but with a little twist because now you guys are in our homes. Um, it's a really great time now to talk about mouse-related issues that you probably didn't have time to think about before, um, and all the things that I kind of wish I had known when I was on the bench, um, things that probably would have made me a better scientist. So hopefully you've gotten your cup of coffee and put your feet up because it's time for Mice Tech Talk. We've only got 15 minutes, which is just enough time for you to finish your coffee. So today, let's talk cryo. All right, so the motivation behind us talking about cryo was in response to a bunch of phone calls and emails that we got from researchers like you. Um, back in February and March, we just got a ton of phone calls from researchers needing to cryopreserve their mice strains as their facilities were closing down um, during widespread shelter-in-place orders by local governments and universities. So that's a little bit of background. What do we have planned, Caitlin? So we've got some fun poll questions planned for you today and throughout our show, and we'd love it if you would participate. So I'm going to go ahead and open the first poll question for you. So first, select the appropriate answers, um, and then be sure to click the Submit button so we can actually see your answers. So to practice this, here's our first poll question. How many of you are going to be interrupted on this session by A, a cat walking across a keyboard, B, a dog barking, C, a child needing your attention, or D, the sudden urge to watch something more interesting on YouTube? So, so give you guys. I'm actually, yeah, I'm oh. actually going to submit my answers too. So go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, give you guys just a couple more seconds to get those answers in. Just make sure you hit submit um, after selecting your answers. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and just close this. Oh, the trepidation. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. Let's see it. Oh, I'm the only one who said sudden urge to watch more interesting YouTube videos. <laughs> awesome. It looks like a uh, cat walking across the keyboard is equally uh, likely as dog barking. <laughs> and then some of you, like me, might have children. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, luckily this morning all the children drama happened, so hopefully we can skip through that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right now. All right, so that was a great practice. Um, now to answer a real poll question so we can really understand where you are right now and how to adapt our content um, and how we spend our time. So Caitlin, can you pull up the next one? Absolutely. So same deal, more serious question. Um, select all the answers that apply to your work situation right now. Um, you're able to go to your animal facility and care for your mice as normal. B is you're able to go to your animal facility, do your experiments on a limited schedule. C is uh, what I'm going to select, which is mostly completely working from home. Uh, and I also don't do mouse experiments anymore. Um, D, your animal facility is starting to open. E, your animal facility eliminated or reduced the size of your colonies. F, you crowd preserved your mouse strains. G, you did not pr preserve your mouse strains. And uh, select as many that apply, and we'll see what, what happens. I think there's going to be some overlap. All right, how's it coming? Let's keep it. All yeah, right, well, we will go ahead and close that poll. All right. All right. Let's see. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like 
only one of you is able to go normally, some limited schedules. Um, many of you are working solely from home. Animal facility, what was the, that one? Oh, animal facility is starting to open again, a few of you. Um, many of you had a reduction in colony size. Some of you cryopreserved and some of you did not. Okay, so there's a, a good mixture. Thank you. Uh, thanks for participating in that. Yeah. So it seems like uh, we have answers that are all over the board. So we've prepared a few topics to start the discussion today. Um, so you can ask content related questions during our show. So use the Q&A function that's on the right um, of the screen and we'll try to answer some of those live. Uh, we'll keep your name private so you will remain anonymous. And so I think the best place to start, Janine, since we're just kind of all over the place from that last poll question, is let's just talk about what cryopreservation is and why it's done. Sure, so cryo is basically, uh, cryopreservation is a way to save genetic material from unique mouse strains. Um, either they have a unique genetic background or they have some engineered or spontaneous mutations of interest. And it's a way to hang on to them forever uh, in the freezer. So, um, it, mice are a unique uh, tool that is used in science, and so this is one of those ways that you can kind of keep those mice available for all time. Um, this can be done by either saving the sperm of the mutant mice or the uh, genetically unique mice um, or embryos, and we'll talk about um, why you might serve, uh, save sperm versus embryo. Great. So you said that this is a way to maintain genetic material uh, forever, essentially. Um, so that's definitely one of the benefits of cryopreservation, but maybe you can touch on some of the other benefits of cryopreservation. Yeah, I think um, super relevant to right now, obviously, is just uh, the insurance policy of uh, unique strains. Since many of you said you had to reduce colonies and um, you might not be able to go to your facility right now, there is uh, uh, obviously an animal welfare issue of producing mice um, and breeding them when you don't know when you're going to come back. Um, also, there's the possibility of, um, you know, we don't know how long a pandemic is going to last. We don't know when the next storm is going to happen. Uh, maybe if you're in California, you won't know when the next giant earthquake is just going to rip California off into the ocean. So <laughs> cryopreservation is kind of a way to make sure that uh, those mouse strains are saved um, for anybody who needs to use them. Um, the next kind of related to that is uh, the, the benefit of uh, saving your strains is about genetic drift. I think that's something that people don't really think about very often, um, and it certainly wasn't something I thought about as a researcher. Uh, but because mice are always breeding, you're actually um, putting them under pressure to change their genetic material every time they breed. And, and it's not like a directed pressure, but pretty much any time mice breed, there is a possibility for different DNA mutations or mistakes to occur during DNA replication, and that can be passed on to future generations of mice in the form of what's called genetic drift. So if those um, mutations actually get fixed in your colony, you actually have mice that are starting to kind of change from the way they were when you first got them. And it's kind of like evolution happening under your nose without you even knowing it. Um, so why that matters is if you're breeding mice or you've reduced colony size um, because you can't go back into your facility, you've actually put your mice under kind of a genetic pressure or a genetic bottleneck. Um, and so then when you re-expand and you bring your mice out of that small colony, you've now reduced it down to this, this bottleneck and now you're propagating um, more mice that may have these accumulated mutations. So why that matters to a researcher is from a reproducibility standpoint. Um, if you are using mice that have drifted genetically, you might also have problems with reproducibility. Um, the last point uh, is uh, there's a, an overall cost of breeding a low-use colony, and that comes in both a financial cost as well as animal uh, number cost. Um, so cryopreserving is a good way to um, reduce your financial burden as well as your animal use burden. So here in TIS, we get a lot of questions about the cost of sperm cryopreservation and embryo cryopreservation, and a lot of people want to pick the cheaper option. Um, but could you 
enlighten us on the differences between sperm and embryo cryopreservation and why you might pick one over the other? Yeah, so sperm overall, of what Caitlin, Dr. Caitlin was alluding to, was <laughs> sperm is generally um, less expensive. Um, and so uh, under certain uh, conditions, um, sperm might be preferable and embryo might be preferable. Um, so you've got a few things that you have to think about. Um, the first one is the genetic background of your strain. So if it is a like, well-known congenic strain, it's a pure genetic background, um, you might be looking more at sperm. If it is something more complex where it's a mixture of many different genetic backgrounds or an undefined or unique genetic background, you might want embryo. And uh, that's because of the way that the, um, the material is saved and then eventually is going to be cryo-recovered if you plan to do that. Um, I'll go through the other uh, uh, kind of considerations and explain why that matters. Um, the second consideration is the number of mutations that are present. So generally, sperm is used when there's a single mutation, and embryo is used when you have two or more mutations. And then the last consideration is the number of males and females you have present. So sperm cryo takes only two males that are about 10 to 16 weeks of age, whereas embryo cryo, you also have to have females that can supply oocytes for that cryopreservation. So why all this stuff matters, um, essentially what happens is you take a male that uh, is relatively young, between uh, 10 and 16 weeks, and we collect the sperm from them. Uh, we can freeze that down for sperm uh, cryopreservation, or we can also take the females at the same time, and usually it's like 20 females or even more females. And the reason why we want so many females is because we need to um, super ovulate them so they can produce oocytes. Um, and so in order to create an embryo cryopreservation, you have to take the sperm from the males, the um, oocytes from the females, and have them um, uh, in a dish for in vitro fertilization. And uh, you, you would want to do that if, again, the mutation is, uh, there are several mutations in this uh, strain that you're looking at, or that the genetic background is very unique. And the reason for that is one day when you want to cryo-recover your mice, you're going to have to either cryo-recover from sperm or embryo. So if you're cryo-recovering from sperm, you can take that frozen sperm and super-ovulate wild-type females that might be already living. Maybe it's a black 6J mouse or an FBBNJ mouse. Um, and then you can do that uh, two-cell embryo or, or in vitro fertilization in a dish. Um, but if it's a unique genetic background or you've got multiple mutations present, you actually have to have the embryos frozen down so that you, one, don't lose the genetic background that you were um, uh, freezing them down under. And then, two, you're not segregating all of the mutations that you work so hard to put together in exactly the right genotypes. Awesome. So we have just a couple minutes left. Um, so that leaves us some time for Q&A. So if you have any last minute questions, go ahead and type them into that Q&A function. Um, but we do have a couple questions already. Um, someone is asking, is there a wait time that's longer than usual um, to get a cryo recovery? And how long does it normally take to get live mice shipped? Yeah, so right now at JAX, we are running just as normal. So there isn't anything unusual about what we're doing here. Um, it does take like a roughly three months to get live mice under any circumstance. Um, uh, we are actually going to talk about this next week in our next week's Mice Tech Talk, um, so you guys can tune into that. Um, but everything that we're doing right now is the same. Um, if you guys are at home waiting around and you think in three months you're going to get back into your facilities, now's a great time to think about cryo-recovering um, since you're just going to have to wait anyway. All right, and we've had a couple questions about pricing. So what's the pricing for a sperm cryopreservation versus embryo cryopreservation? Yeah, so sperm cryo, um, it depends on what we're doing, but generally it's about $1,500 to $2,000 for sperm cryo if we do it. Um, do everything. We also have a cryopreservation kit where if you know what you're doing, um, you maybe you're part of a core facility, um, we can give you a cryo kit. I think it's like around the same price, but you can preserve up to five strains. 
Um, embryo cryopreservation gets more expensive because, again, as we mentioned, there's a lot of females involved. Um, they have to be the right age. Um, we have to do a lot more in terms of um, super ovulating them. Um, so it can be upwards of uh, two to $5,000, depending on how complex your strain is. Um, something that I didn't mention is the genetic background of your mice does impact um, how well they respond to um, super ovulation and to cryopreservation. Well, that's all we have time for this week. So tune in again next week for Mice Tech Talk, and the topic will be Let's Talk Cohorts. We're also running a follow-up on this topic tomorrow live on our LinkedIn and Twitter. So check us out there on the Jackson Laboratory accounts for more information. So this is Dr. Caitlin saying we miss you and we're looking forward to seeing you next week. So stay home, stay safe, and stay excited about research. All right, bye guys.